Good morning. It's still early morning here and I've been on the trail for the better part of an hour and it's already 25 degrees Celsius with 80% humidity. That puts the Humidex somewhere in the, I don't know, 30s, 35 degrees. Uh, that's the perception of how hot it is. I can tell you this, I'm already soaking through, so it's going to be one of those hot, hot days. So why would I want to come out on a day like this? Well, I questioned myself until I got out here, and then I smelt the forest. It was just alive with all those forest smells that evoke memories of better experiences or other experiences when you're out, maybe when you're young, special memories. That was reason enough to come out. But I do have a second reason, of course. It is a hike and a coffee video. And today's subject, uh, I'm not quite sure what the final title will be. It could be cheap versus expensive or budget versus expensive. All right, we'll figure it out as we go along. Question of the day, and I'll be honest now, I don't know what the answer to this is. This is a paper birch. It's alive, but there's a black mark on it, which I first took for some kind of a fungal thing. I'm trying to give you the best I can. I know the sun is blanking it out or silhouetting it, but I'll get around. And when I got around to this side and I had a look at it, I am pretty sure it's fire related. It looks very much as if the tree, somebody had attempted to light it on fire. Now you can see a split in the bark. Hopefully I'll see if I can't zoom in on it. However, panning down to the ground, there are no fires or evidence of fires anywhere. The, um, oh, by the way, that's 10 feet off of the ground. So I have a couple of theories. Most likely one is somebody with a torch if in fact it is fire related. I mean, even the bark is, it, you can see the smoke. Hopefully you can see the smoke stains. The bark is blistered as if it was lit up. Either a torch, maybe a limited lightning strike, but I'm in uh, uh, you know, quite a bit of canopy here, so I can't see that. <laughs> maybe spontaneous combustion. I'm open to guesses. If somebody does know the answer, please share. This one is a mystery to me. So something a little different today for coffee. Uh, this is something my wife gave me as a, I don't know, probably last Christmas as a stocking stuffer. It's an individualized packaged coffee from one of our local roasters, but it's in one of those, I think they oftentimes call them elephant ear type of an arrangement. It's a coffee filter with wings that you push out and hold down over the edges of your mug. This was actually suggested to me by one of my viewers and for the life of me, I cannot find your name. And if I, it doesn't appear on the screen right now, then please do put your name in the comment section so that I was the one that suggested these to you. And the reason I mention that is you can buy these coffee filter bags with the little folder wings uh, individually empty so that you can put your own coffee in. The Java blend has not been the best coffee that we have in local roasters, but it's been okay. So I don't expect great things, but I expect good things. How about that? All right, let's take the kettle off and slowly pour the coffee in, or the water, not the coffee. It's a, it's a pour over really is what it is, but you just have to take your time. Actually, it's the first time I've used one of these, so I'm learning as you do. All right, what I'll do is I'll finish pouring this in and running it through and getting a good sized cup of coffee out of it, and then we'll set up for our discussion. A taste test of the coffee. Okay, not bad. Not great. Just not bad. Drinkable. Maybe that's the best way to say it. Java Blend, the makers of this coffee, are a local roastery, uh, here, roaster here in Halifax. Their primary business is roasting coffee for restaurant use. So it's not high-end craft coffee, we'll say. Having said that, they do have a line of craft coffees. 
just wasn't in that little envelope. That was restaurant quality is the best way to describe it. You know, those little envelopes with the, the ears or legs or whatever on them that fit over the cup. I'm going to explore that a little bit more because they were so easy to use. You know, I've seen them on Amazon. Uh, there's a bit of a cost to them, of course. You buy a bundle of 50 or 100 of them. But you know, when you think about it, they're light, they're small, and they're so easy to use. They don't require you to bring out another piece of equipment to use to make your coffee, like a pour-over device. Yeah, there might be some real value in trying that out. And then I can put my own coffee in and control what I'm getting in my cup. Okay, so let's move on to the topic of the day. Budget versus expensive, or expensive versus cheap. I really still haven't come up with a title for this video yet. Well, I'll figure it out as I go along. So what is this video all about and who is it for? So my primary intent here, the focus here, is to help people by giving them a criteria they can use when they're looking to purchase either bushcraft or any outdoor gear. I mean any outdoor gear, not just knives and axes and all that type of thing, but just about anything. Hopefully this criteria will apply. It's intended for people who are purchasing for the very first time or maybe looking to upgrade their kit and they just need a little assistance trying to decide how to go about deciding, I guess. It's really not intended for people that have a lot of experience and skills with the equipment they have. This is not for you. So having said that though, if you are watching this video and you fall into that last category, you're welcome to comment on this on this video, on this topic. I open it up. If you have anything that you want to say about budget versus expensive, please do, please do so, respectfully, of course. And the reason I say that is because I don't have all the answers. I have what I think are some good criteria that I want to share with you, but it, I can't be a comprehensive here. I can't give you a video that answers every question somebody might come up with. It's more of a primer a starting place, a discussion starter, we'll call it. Okay, so that's the intent of the video. That's what this video is all about, or this discussion is all about. Now, before we get into the criteria themselves, we have to talk about terminology. What do I mean when I say something is budget or cheap, or something is expensive? Well, I gave myself a few notes, and this is just a few words that I put to them, each of the terms, and uh, you may have others, again, Put them in the, in the comment section if you want to. So when I say budget, another word that comes to mind is cheap, affordable, economical, common man, and high value. Keep that high value in mind for a moment. On the other hand, when you say expensive, you tend to think overpriced, extravagant, exorbitant, but heritage item is another word I've used, I've heard used for, high, or for expensive. And again, high value. So how can high value be applied to something that's inexpensive and to something that is expensive. Well, value is a relative term to the value you place on the item. Now, I'm getting ahead of myself because that actually fits into part of the discussion. So high value does or can apply to both of those. All right, the criteria. Number one, this should be obvious, right? What is your budget? How much money do you have to spend on the equipment you're considering purchasing? In the big picture now, you have to make sure all your needs are taken care of, and this is money that you want to put towards this. For most of us, it's a hobby. It's not a necessity. For some of us, they live out in the woods. That's not me. I'm out here by choice as a bit of a hobby. Having said that though, I have a budget that I can afford to buy a few things. And the reason I have a budget is I'm working part-time to afford my hobby, YouTube. That's my part-time job. It's not a lot of money, trust me. But it does allow me to purchase a few things that if I didn't have that money, I probably could not purchase for myself. Uh, and yeah, that's another discussion altogether, of course, is YouTube. So that's it. What is your budget? And you have to prioritize the things that you are looking at. What's most important to you? And that kind of takes us into the next criteria, wants versus needs. There are a lot of things I want to have, but there's not a lot of things I really truly need. So now we have to separate your wants versus your needs. And what happens often is the hype and that is out there and the, and the promotion and the advertising around some things changes something in our minds from being a want into a need. And it may not necessarily be the case. So that's just, this is kind of hopefully will help you kind of cut through some of the hype and say, do I need this or is it just something I really want to have? I mean, you can have what you want sometimes as long as it's in your budget, but wants versus need. Okay, 
part of the question is, is what are you going to be doing when you're out here? Are you out here for the day as a hobbyist, trying to learn a few bushcraft skills? It's a part of just, uh, you know, getting out and exploring the woods and having a good time, learning about the plants, the animals, and the nature in general. Or are you out here by uh, profession, maybe? Maybe you're a, a woodland biologist and you spend just about every day out here, or you're a professional adventurer, or you're planning a long-term event out in the woods, like a hike of the Appalachian Trail. You know, there's a number of things that come into play. So you have to decide how often are you going to be in the woods, when, meaning time of year as much as anything, are you going to be in the woods, and what are your activities when you're out there? For instance, let's get back to knives and axes for specifically. There are some really nice axes. I have pretty much all what I consider the very best axes. I've been very fortunate. Some of them have been gifts, some of them have been sent to me for review, and others I just purchased through the money that I earn myself. But I don't need them. I can get by with a less expensive axe for the work that I'm doing. But if I was out here every day and I was counting on that axe to perform at its peak efficiency every day, then maybe it is a higher priority than it is for someone who's not out here every day. That means you can put more money, justify putting more money to something based on its use and the amount of use you're going to use it for. Again, if you're not out here all the time, you probably don't need a council tool axe. Maybe you can go and get an axe from your local hardware stores. And that's the way, of course, I started it, is, well, free. That's the way I started it, but we'll get to that in a few moments' time. So wants versus needs in terms of uh, when you will use it. Now, here's a few other things. We often want things based on the marketing and hype that is out there. The problem is, is oftentimes it can disappoint us when we get it in our hands. The ideal thing to do is to be able to try it before you buy it. So if you have a friend that has the item, then you can put it in your hands and use it or look at it and experience it and go through all the details of it, then that's one thing. If you can't, what kind of a warranty does it have? Because if you're going to be using this thing and you run up against an issue, then you want to know that you're covered and you'll get it repaired, get it replaced, whatever the warranty is good for. Uh, so that's just another part of the wants versus needs. Now, I'm just going to close this criteria off with a saying that's often said, which is buy once, cry once, and enjoy for a lifetime. You've probably heard that said before. And what that really means is something may be a bit on the expensive side. From your perspective, you're thinking, that's just a little bit too much. But at the same time, you know if you own it, you're going to use it and you're going to maximize its potential. So you buy it. You may regret a little bit the purchase of the price that you had to pay for it but then you begin to love it and you enjoy it for a lifetime. That's basically what that saying means. Sometimes you just have to put the money down to get the item that lives up to the expectations you have for it. All right, now, next criteria. Expensive equipment versus skill level. And I think we've all seen this, and I, I know I have, and some of the people that I know, and that is they don't have a high skill level because they're not putting the time in to develop those skills. So they try to compensate for the lack of skills by buying something expensive, which is touted as being better for whatever the chore is. This applies to knives, doesn't it? That probably mostly to knives. So people will, and, and I have a friend in particular, and, and, and he's probably want to watch this video, and I don't want him to think I'm criticizing him, but we've talked about this often. He has put money into knives with really good super steel in them because he's not very good at sharpening knives. You see the circle on this, right? Had he taken some of that expensive, um, that money for that expensive knife and put it into some basic stones or whatever equipment you're going to use for sharpening your knives and then worked on his skill level with the less expensive knives that he already owned, then he may have decided he never needed to go to the expensive one. Or, once he's got the skill level down, maybe then he looks at getting the expensive knife. And I've said this in, in reviews of knives before, expensive steels or the super steels are nice, but even they dull. And when they dull, <laughs> you're going to have to sharpen them, unless you're going to pay someone else to do it. And they can be harder to sharpen 
then the less expensive steels often is the case. So I just want to put that out there and that goes for a lot of things. I'm not very good at this so I'll buy a more expensive item and that'll make me better. That's not true of course. The only way you're going to get your skill level is by getting out here, getting your dirt time and making mistakes, learning what you're capable of, improving your skills, maximizing the piece of equipment you have and then when you've done that now you're ready to decide do I really need to move up to the next one? Maybe you don't. Maybe you're happy with what you already have. All right so that's that criteria covered. And just last thing before we move on to the next criteria, this is something I learned years ago when I was a police officer and it's a saying that we put it because the same thing um, everybody wanted a better gun a better sidearm and uh, we did like eventually our, our agency moved up through different grades of sidearms I mean back in the day I was issued a Smith & Wesson 38 revolver and I used that to the point of almost wearing it out by the time it was ready to be replaced we were starting to move into nine millimeters so it was just a progression but I used to compete in IPSEC, International Practical Shooting Competitions, with my revolver. And that's when somebody made this statement to me that uh, I, I've remembered ever since. Beware of the person who owns only one gun. They probably know how to use it. Sorry, I think that's enough said there. Okay, emotional purchases. Now, I, I'm one way I'm talking about um, what do they call the impulse buys? I am talking about that when I say emotional purchase, but that's not the only thing. Impulse buys are something we have to control ourselves. Don't buy it because Mark said it's a good piece of equipment. Don't buy it because you've got some money that's just burning a hole in your pocket. Don't buy it because it's pretty or it has, you know, it's sexy or it's, you know, it's really tactical or anything else. That, that's a, an impulse buy. But at the same time, if you do purchase something, how does it make you feel owning it? And that's a legitimate criteria. If you're going to buy something and you're not happy with it, if you don't like showing it to people, if you don't like using it, then it wasn't a good buy. It doesn't matter how good the item is for someone else. It doesn't matter how little you, money you paid for it or how much money you paid for it. If you don't like it, then it was the wrong purchase for you. At the same time, whether or not it's an inexpensive item or a very expensive item, and it makes you feel good just to own it, just to hold it, just to use it. Every time you take that knife out of your holster and you put it to wood, you say, yeah, I really enjoy using this. You're proud to show it off to people. It's not, it's not a safe queen. It's not something you just put away and only show off on spe you know, special days or get them out, wipe them down, put them back in. But it's an item that you use and you're proud and happy that you invested in it. So that's also an emotional purchase and a legitimate criteria for owning something. At least it is in my my way of thinking. Um, there is one more. I was looking for the right terminology for this and this is what I come up with. Now this may not be the best terminology. If you know what it is I'm talking about and you know the more accurate term for this then put it in the comments section below. But I've heard it refer referred to as choice supportive bias or post purchase rationalization. And that is, is when you spend a lot of money on something, probably more than you should have because it was more of a want than a need. And now that you have it, it's the greatest thing ever. There's nothing like it on earth. And you say that because you have to justify in your mind why you spent all that money. Maybe you have to justify it to someone else who lives in the house with you, but you justify it and really it's not everything you expected it to be. You just don't want to admit you made a mistake in purchasing it. I've done that. Okay, I've done it and I've learned from that and uh, I just share that my experience that sometimes you just have to take do a reality check and say is am I just trying to rationalize the purchase I have? If you know that that's a possibility go back to step one go to your budget and work your way down through each of those criteria. Okay last thing I want to talk about is custom versus uh, uh, what do you call it, standard off the shelf, uh, factory made stuff and DIY or modified things. And I say this for a reason. I started out in the bushcraft world here using things that I made. Uh, I was watching YouTube videos like everybody else was and I was seeing what other people were using and I said, wow, I'd love to have that, but I really can't justify it yet. So I made my own, like Ikea hobo stoves. I made all kinds of them and made videos on them and they're still some of the best wood stoves you can get especially for the money because they're mostly almost free 
they still work very well. Having said that, I've maximized my capability with those things. I know what I want in wood stoves. Now I'm at a point where um, I can make good decisions about moving up to the next level, to the next level, to the next level of wood stoves, and actually probably even offer some input on design of wood stoves. So that's just one uh, point to be made about DIY. Now, as well, you might be able to buy something that's not very expensive, is close to what you want, but you can modify it. And you don't mind doing that because you didn't invest a lot of money in it. And if it changes it and it doesn't work out, you really didn't waste a lot of money in it either. So that's reasons for going the, down the DIY route uh, or the custom, or not the custom made, we'll get to that in a minute, or the modified route. And basically, maybe it is, you're not sure what it is you like yet. And you've got to try something out. So you try with the DIY, the homemade ones to start with. Okay, now when it comes to the factory made items, this is where the world is huge, right? And you do your best based on advertising, based on YouTube videos, reviews like things that I do here, based on what a friend tells you, based on the fact that you've been able to play with one for a while, and you try to decide if this is what you want. Now, there is a range and I'm um, thinking knives again, there is a range of expenses and expense doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be the best choice for you or cost. Let's take Mora knives or BPS or Beavercraft, high value knives, you get a lot of knife for not a lot of money. Uh, for a lot of people, that's exactly where they should be starting out. That's where I started out. I still have my Mora Robust, which was my first true bushcraft knife. And for a lot of people, that's where they stay. That's as far as they want to go in terms of development of or in purchasing their knives. They're happy with that. I wasn't. I needed to go on beyond that. But you can go to the other extreme and look at the TRC knives, which are so, ex or the Falcon even, so expensive. Are they that much better? In somebody's hands, probably. In most people's hands, probably not, because back to the skill level again, right? So the last thing I want to say there is custom knives. Now, this applies to not a lot of people, but it certainly applies to some people. You've got enough experience now with knives or whatever it is that you're ready to have something custom made, made to order for you. You know what the criteria is for it, and you're going to ask someone to make it you can expect to pay more than market price for anything that's factory made for sure. But it might be worth the investment. Best example I can give is my own uh, purchases. I have a couple of custom made knives by blacksmiths that I know locally here who do excellent work. And I was able to tell them what I wanted and they were able to accommodate that. And the biggest one for me is hand side, XL to double XL hands. Most factory production knives are meant for medium to large hands, occasionally extra large hands. Sometimes I can use them, but have, I have come across very few knives that will fit me as well as a custom made one does in my hand. And that's only the beginning of customization, of course. Okay, that's a lot to think about. And I doubt that anybody's gonna sit down with a checklist and go over each item as they look at something. But at least it's a starting place for people, you know, start out with what is your budget, wants versus needs, your skill level and your experience level, your, how this was going to make you feel if you do buy it. And then after all that, should I be looking at just making my own or should I be looking at buying something off the shelf or should I be looking at a custom item? Okay, that's the, all wrapped up in a thumbnail. Okay, we'll wrap this video up shortly by saying... This was just a discussion starter, a conversation beginning. It's so much that we can put into this, and we've all got experiences that we can share. You're welcome to share them respectfully, of course, in the comments section below. And that's all I'll say for today. But until next time, get out and explore and take that pathless travel, because it will make all the difference. Bye for now.